everything sound set up. Okay, sounds good too. Hi, everybody. All right. Well, I am stoked to be here today um, for just to go over some cool uh, creative coding fun stuff. So don't really have a, um, a plan to go through today, but I thought we would just go um, over some ways to use uh, P5.js. So uh, P5 is a creative coding library uh, built off of the processing um, library, if you're familiar with that, but it's built for the web and set up uh, to recreate what you can do in processing uh, using web technologies. Um, it's great to kind of, if you have some familiarity with coding or you don't have any coding at all, uh, experience at all, this is a great kind of starting point to just start uh, having fun with code because pretty much what we're going to be doing is just drawing stuff on a screen and then animating those things on the screen. Um, and just uh, for everyone's uh, uh, for background, so if, if you're interested in doing this, I'm pretty much everything I'm using today is all online. So I'm using a an editor that was created by the P5JS team. So this is a website where you can go in and start writing code and start to see things happening on your screen. Um, I can share some of those resources. Um, another thing too, if, uh, let me start up a new project here. So I'm gonna get a blank canvas. So if anyone does want to um, say, follow along or um, access this outside of uh, today, I will share, uh, we can easily share stuff we create in this p5.js editor. Maybe I just need to give it a, first give it a title here. So I'm just gonna call Twitch stream and it is April 9th. All right, so if you're not familiar with uh, P5, as I said, it's a creative coding library that allows us to uh, create art. We can draw things on the screen. We can, uh, on the web, we can interact with different parts of say a web page. Um, we can mess around with audio. So we can do some web audio stuff so we can create and uh, manipulate sound, all types of cool things you can do with this uh, tool. And I will be probably jumping back and forth between um, the reference. So this is pretty much everything you can do with P5 here. So all the different functions and uh, ways you can manipulate the things you draw. So I'll probably be jumping in there. So you get a taste of kind of what's available with the P5 language. But first off, we have this really basic setup to actually be able to draw anything on the screen. So we have just seven lines of code here that's got um, my setup and then uh, my drawing function. So I'm just going to go ahead, let's just play what we'll play what this code does. All right. So when I press that play button, you'll notice on the right hand side here, I get this gray square. So what's happening here, I have a setup function that's running. It's creating a canvas. So we call this create canvas function here. And we're passing in two parameters, 400 and 400. So those parameters indicate the width and height of a canvas. So this gray square we see is a canvas and we can draw on that canvas. What we can draw is defined in this draw function right here. So this draw function is actually, um, uh, it's changing over time. So this draw function is called every time our computer screen or our browser screen refreshes. So this is reactive. So we can pass things into here that are that change over time. Right now, I'm just calling one function in here called background. And I just know what that function does. It sets the color of the background for our canvas. And right now we're just passing in a number. I can change that number. And a cool thing with uh, the P5JS editor online too is it automatically um, refreshes whenever you update the code. So I don't have to constantly stop um, and run 
my code. So there we go. So right now you can just see, I can change some variable or I can change some input in here. So I know background, it varies between um, a value of zero and 255. If I pass in just one number with zero equaling black and 255 equal zero. So it's pretty much, uh, we have a values from zero to 255 that indicate um, the amount of white or black. So it's a grayscale. So if I pass a value in the middle, 127, I'm going to get gray. So that's cool. We have a gray square. One of the first things I'm just going to set up here is I won't, I, I don't want to deal with the um, explicitly set size here. I want to actually make this, um, this window or the, our canvas the same size as the window view we have here. So P5 has a lot of cool built-in um, variables uh, that you can call to, um, to, to, to style things, to um, do things like, uh, um, say you want to know the size of the window you're working in. Um, if you're working in just regular JavaScript, you have to put in a couple of um, things to actually figure that out. But P5 has this nice, nice built-in constant just called window width. And that recognizes the window in which my canvas is, that's the width of it. So now I'm setting the size of my canvas to be the width of the window. And now I'll just do the same thing with height. So I have this window height. So now our canvas is just taking up the entire um, window of our uh, preview here. One thing you notice too though, when I change the um, size of this window, the canvas doesn't actually change along with it. So we're going to do one more thing to make our canvas reactive to the actual window size. So I'm just going to define a new function here. And this is a built-in function into P5 called window resize. And this function is automatically run anytime the window is resized. So when I do something like this and pull the um, side to make the width bigger. So I'm just going to reset this. I'm going to call another. I'm pretty sure this is what I want to do here. Resize canvas. And you'll notice now, no matter what uh, size my window is, my canvas will automatically uh, reset to become that size. So now we have a responsive canvas. So no matter if anyone, uh, say we share this out, no matter what device they're looking at it on, it's gonna be relative to the size of their screen. So there's just some easy setup things. All right, and let's go through some of the things. So right now, I guess we're not doing anything too fun yet. I apologize, but let's start to draw some things on our, on our canvas here. So there are some built-in primitive um, drawing types that we can just out of the box start to create inside of uh, P5. We can draw rectangles by using this rect method here. So that takes in uh, a couple of parameters. We have to set the X and Y position. So I'm just going to draw a rectangle on the screen here and let's just see what that looks like. Let's make it a little bigger than that. So right now I passed in three parameters into this rect. It has, um, you can go look at the documentation if you're interested. Um, thanks for sharing the reference in chat. But pretty much what this takes in, it has an X position, which is gonna be in pixels, the X position, how far it is from the left-hand side of our canvas. So this is 10 pixels in, and then it's gonna be the Y position. And this is gonna be 10 pixels down from the top of our canvas. So right now, I know exactly where it's gonna be um, based on those first two parameters. And then I'm this third parameter I'm passing in, this is, if I, if I only have this third parameter, that's gonna be the width and the height of a rectangle. So pretty much it's just creating a square. Um, if I wanted to create a rectangle, I can pass in one more parameter. And in this case, 100 is gonna equal the width of the rectangle. And then, Let's make it twice the length, twice the width. And now I have the height of the triangle. 
I mean of the rectangle, excuse me. So again, um, say I wanted to create another rectangle and I want it to be right below the other one. I can say start to, um, oh, let's see, we want that to be 210. So now I can start to see move things around on my canvas, which is fun. Maybe say we'll give it like a little bit of gap in between there. So that's nice. I can uh, I can draw other things like ellipses, and it's similar to a rectangle. So this is how we can draw circles. Let's put um, an ellipse. Let's say. 50 and 50, so that's the X and the Y position. And then let's make it pass in 20 here. So these parameters are passing here, very similar to rect. We have our X and Y position. I'm just gonna change those, make it in the um, center here. And then 20 is gonna be the radius of the circle in pixels that we just drew. If you wanna draw like an egg shape, you can do ovals by passing in one more parameter, so 20 will be the X radius, and then uh, say we'll make this 50, and that will be the Y radius now. So you can see how you can start to edit a bunch of these parameters and how your shapes will change based on that. And let's see, there are other things we can draw here. We can draw lines, and those just take in um, a starting X position Let's say we'll start at zero, zero. So that's gonna be the top left corner of my canvas. And let's make this line go to, um, let's just say 500 and 500. Well, 500 and 5,000. All right, so now we just have a diagonal line. So one thing, um, right now we've just been hard coding actual numbers into here. And you notice too, we have the idea um, we have this responsive canvas, but say I always want this uh, uh, line to come out the same proportion of the screen relative to uh, whatever screen people are looking at this on. So we can actually start to use some other built-in parameters that uh, P5 or built-in um, constants that P5 provides. So say instead of um, I want this line to come out 500 pixels, I can call this uh, built-in parameter width. So that value will always equal the width of my canvas. Let's say I want it to go to the middle of the canvas. I can do width divided by two. And say I always want this to point to the middle height of the canvas. I can do height divided by two. And now you notice too, when I start to move my window around, that line is always anchored to the zero, zero point and the middle of our screen. So a question in chat here, are there limits on how big the shapes can be since the canvas is responsive? No, you can make these shapes however big you want to. But the idea of responsiveness is meaning that um, the shapes will scale relative to the size of the, um, of the canvas. So say we want, uh, let me get rid of all of this right here. So say we want a rectangle that's always at the center of our screen. So I'm gonna, I'm going to set the um, width and height parameters. So that's the X and Y position. And then we'll just make this uh, 100 by 100. And again, I don't have to have that extra uh, position in here. And note too, the X position and the Y position aren't the center of the box, but it's the upper left-hand corner of the box. So if I really wanted this to be in the center, I need to separate or subtract the um, half the width and half the height of that box. All right, and let's say we'll make this responsive in another way too. Say we want this uh, box to always be um, half the width of the canvas. And now I'm gonna get confused here of all the, all right. So now what, what we got here, 
we have our um, uh, why can't we agree with the origin should be? I agree, right? There is a nice, um, I haven't um, delved into this so much into um, P5, but one thing, let's just check out the um, uh, documentation here. One thing you can do, if you always want it to be based on the center, you can set rect mode, which means, um, let's see, I'm pretty sure this is how you can either say, I want to use the corner as the reference point, or you want to use the center as the reference point. So I could just call this uh, method right here, like say in my setup, I want my rect mode to be center. And you'll notice now I can take away the width minus half of the height, but I'm used to the corner. So I'm gonna undo all that. I apologize for you center people. All right, okay, and so the reason I was showing this is because we get the idea of responsiveness. So now we'll see that rectangle will change its size relative to the width of our canvas. So the reason I like to do this is because, um, again, this is a web-based uh, uh, thing that we're drawing. And if you're sharing something with people, we're not always gonna have the same exact um, display size. So now I can create something and it's always going to be relative to the size of the screen that someone is looking at it on. And that's not always going to work out, you know, um, like if someone has a really thin display, I don't know what display this would be. You'll see my box starts to go off the screen here. But for the most part, it will work for what we want to do. Okay. So this is cool and all, but we've just been drawing static things on the screen. And remember, I said this draw function runs every time. So it's going to redraw any of the code we have in here every time the screen refreshes. So let's actually start to create some dynamic things. So I'm just going to create a little smaller box. I'm just going to set it. It will make its upper left-hand corner. It's just going to be at the top of our screen here. we will make it 10 pixels. But I'll make it a little bigger so we can all see. So I have a rectangle in my top corner here. And let's say I wanted to start actually changing the position of this. One thing we're going to have to add in is something to keep track of changes. So outside of my draw and my setup function, I'm just going to create a new variable called step. And that's just going to equal zero to start out with. And I'm using this to say um, I'm going to take this step every time my browser refreshes, my screen refreshes. So in your experience, does this translate well with mobile devices screens? So I'm just reading that from chat. Yeah, it does. Um, you know, it depends on if you make it relative to the window size and height, and you really think about uh, an understanding of different browser and um, uh, phones, uh, mobile device sizes, you can make it work. And again, it's not always going to be perfect depending on the screen, but uh, if you follow that responsive design style of where things are scaled based on the size of a window, it's going to be, it's going to be closer to working than if you don't, if you hard code those numbers in because 100 pixels is always going to be 100 pixels, regardless of what someone's looking at it on. All right. So I have my first step as zero and what I'm going to do, I just want to increment that value each time my draw function runs. So here I'm just using um, shorthand notation here to say each time this is called, add one to step and save it as step. So reassign step to step plus one. And here's another kind of handy thing inside of uh, P5. I'm gonna draw some text on the screen so we can keep track of our, um, the values that we're kind of working with here. So, All right. All right. So there's my actual, this is the number step. And what I just did right there, I called two methods, text size that just sets the size of the text. And then I'm calling this text method, which allows you to pass in um, a value, a string, and then set the position of it in the X, Y position. 
So now you can just see, this is how fast my um, browser is refreshing. Let's just re rerun it. So it starts out at zero when it's counting up each time draw runs. So you'll see that draw is running pretty quickly over and over and over again. All right, so moving numbers, that's really exciting, but let's actually make our rectangle start to move. So instead of say passing zero into the Y position, let's pass in step. Oh, fine. We have a nice, slowly moving rectangle. Now let's pass that into the X position. Ah, now we have a nice diagonally moving rectangle. Let's do it one more time. Let's see what happens when we pass in step for the size. So now we have a moving and a growing rectangle. Uh-oh. It's going away from us. So you can start to see if we, you know, utilize these um, changing values, we can change the way things we draw on the screen look over time. Okay, so let's start to do some stuff here. Um, so right now this rectangle is just um, moving to the side of the screen. Let's change one more thing. Let's say we want the background color to change over time as well. So I'm gonna do one thing before I do this. I'm gonna set my step level to be a much smaller number. So you'll see now my rectangle should be moving much slower because we're in incrementing that value by 0.1 instead of one now. And let's just say, let's pass step into our background now too. So we're starting off with a black value. Let's make it go a little faster but not too fast. So I'm making, I'm just trying to get these smaller variables. So I don't want anything flashing on the screen for us or these smaller values. So you'll see now, um, step, remember I said that this value between zero or this black to white value is zero to 255. You notice once my value gets to 255 here, it's gonna be completely white. But this isn't ideal because now um, once we get past 255, that value is never going to change again because this only accepts values um, for RGB color settings between 0 and 255. So there is um, a cool, unique way we can get kind of a cyclical um, value. And that's, I have to jump into your trigonometry class from high school. I don't totally remember all the intricacies of sine, cosine. Etc. But I know we can use that to get to generate values that are always going to be cyclical. So I'm going to change instead of step, I'm going to take the sign of step. And so now this is going to generate when I take the sign of this step, it's going to generate a value in between one and negative one. So let's actually let's print that out. I'm going to change. I'm just going to uncomment. Nope. <laughs> so one thing you'll notice here too, this is cool about um, if you don't update the background, then it's not going to write over any of the um, stuff you drew on the screen beforehand, which is actually really cool. You can utilize that to um, create some cool kind of uh, uh, patterns. Like, let's see, like watch what happens when I change, make the step a lot bigger. I know get the, um, what like the cascading cards from uh, Solitaire on Windows. <laughs> Let me set this to zero, or I mean to 255, so we can actually read our text. So you'll notice um, I'm getting, uh, you'll notice it's really hard to see. Let's say, let me slow this down just a little bit. We'll make this 0 0.01. So you'll see now we get up to 9.9 .9, and now it's going to dip back down. And now we're going to get back up to negative nine and it's going to go back down. <laughs> We've got some uh, nice trig jokes in the chat for anyone interested. It's a good one. All right. So, okay, let's say I actually want to, I, so what I was doing wrong there 
I was doing sine of step. And that's just producing values between negative one and one. So that's not really a good um, value. It's not between, um, not always between zero and 255. So we actually want to make that as a, um, as a fraction of the actual range. So I'm going to multiply that by 255. So what that's going to do is anytime a uh, step sine of step is zero, it's going to be zero. And it's now going to be between zero or one times 255. But one thing you'll notice now too is I'm getting negative values. Let me bump this, uh, the position of the numbers we're printing out. So you notice again, this is always going between positive one and negative one. But you'll see when I'm getting my negative values, my background isn't changing. That's because we're producing a negative value and that's not a valid value um, for a, a color. So again, we need zero through positive 255. So one thing I can do too, to make sure that that um, value or that, that cycle between zero and one or negative one and one is always positive. I can just um, convert that, take the absolute value of that. So now I'm gonna have a nice kind of pulsating. Here, let's actually print out the absolute value of that too. And so now it's just kind of a little more soothing than an abrasive uh, change. I'll show you one other way we can actually vary the, uh, um, make something uh, change over time. There's a, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. I'm just gonna comment or take that out for just a second. One thing we can also do is take step 255 and take the remainder of that. Oh, sorry, wrong way. Is that the thing I just, same thing I just typed? So let's say we want, ah, all right, forget that for a second. So at any rate, here's a nice way that we can cycle through um, something over time, just bouncing in between one and zero. And let's say we want to do the same thing with our rectangle. So here, I, let's say I want my box to be at a, a height of zero. It's a hundred. Um, uh, pixels wide and high, but say I want it to bounce over time in between the width of the screen. So one thing I can do here is very similar. So I know my values for background go in between two, zero and 255. I also know if I want my box to be confined to the values between um, zero and width, I just need to multiply that by width. All right, and now we have a bouncing box. And now let's do something, let's do something with an ellipse for just for fun. All right, and one thing I'm gonna do too is since I'm gonna be reusing this absolute value of sine step, I'm just gonna create a variable for it up here. That way we don't have to type all that out again over and over. And just replace that everywhere I have it. All right, so let's draw a fun um, growing circle. So let's set this circle at the center of our screen. So circles are different than rectangles in that their placement is based on the center of the circle. So. Let's do, let's make a circle that grows a 
we got to make it a lot bigger. Let's say the maximum value it can be is width. All right. So now we have some nice bouncing and so we got a square that's moving, you know, across the X dimension. And now our circle looks like it's moving in like the third dimension here, growing bigger and smaller. So we can create all types of moving things. So also, you know, I said earlier, I'm just going to change back to a, a constant black background. Like you can use, um, the idea of how the background refreshes to actually change uh, the look of something. So let's change this. I'm just going to have the background doesn't update at all. And we get these fun patterns just based on the fact that we're not updating, uh, refreshing or erasing everything on the screen each time the draw function runs. So there's just some like really kind of basic things you can do to start to like make some cool looking things. Like those patterns on that circle look really, really cool to me. And one thing we can do too with background that I um, haven't showed yet is instead of saying um, don't draw it or draw it all, um, draw it completely, we can actually set things like the opacity. So these can help us, uh, you can use that to create some uh, kind of like a shadow or trailing effects. So. I haven't discussed color too much yet, but um, background can take anywhere between one and four variables. So when we have one variable, it's just um, between, it's going to give us a grayscale color. But we can also pass in three variables, and that's going to be the values of red, green, and blue. So let's say I want a blue color. I can leave red and green at zero and then put blue at full blast here. And say we want a mix of red and blue. Now I get this nice kind of pink or fuchsia color, maybe. And we can pass in one more variable too, and that's gonna be the opacity. And again, this can be a value. I'm, I can't remember if this value goes between zero and one. I think it's between zero and 255, but say, I want to um, lower the opacity. You'll see how that kind of works here. So we still see like the, um, the trails of the past drawings, but they get overwritten over time because the next background we're drawing isn't totally um, transparent or isn't totally opaque. So it's partially transparent. And we just mess around with these values to kind of create some different kind of uh, fill All right, and we can just mess around again with those numbers and see the differences. So now we get like trails that disappear relatively quickly. So this is kind of what I like to do with uh, with P5 is just start to draw some things and then start to edit these different parameters and see what things look like. Okay, but we can do we can do a whole lot more. Let's say, let's see, what's something we can do here? One thing I'm gonna do, I don't think we need this text size, at least not right now, but I'm gonna create a function down here just in case we wanna draw some text later. We have a nice function we can just call. <clears throat> And I'm just, I'm just going to set this up. So I'm creating this function that just, it's going to expect a list of values. And for each of the values in that list, I'm just going to print out the value of that. Actually, we don't want to write our values on top of each other. So I'm just going to iterate the height of this to say, so the value of our the size of our text is 25. So 25 times, or 20 times 
times i. And I'll need to add something to that. OK, so now I, I just have that because I know, say, I want to draw some text to the screen. Let's see if that actually works for us now. Oh. OK, so something messed up here. Oh, yeah, sorry. I want that to be a list of values, so I just need to multiply it or add it into uh, inside of square brackets here. So my Y position starting out at zero. So let's see. There we go. All right, and I need to go back to my fully opaque background so we can start reading numbers. All right, so anyway, now I can just print out multiple things to the screen here. If we want to like look at some numbers of what we're using um, as things change. All right. So what else can we draw here? Let's get rid of our rectangle and our ellipse. Um, maybe another fun thing that we can start to do is start to draw like multiple objects at the same time. So let's start to work with four loops here. So let's say, um, so we're just gonna create a for loop here that loops over a set value of numbers. I less than or equal to, let's see, I'm gonna set a parameter here. I'm just gonna call this number of rows because I'm gonna create a row um, columns of something. So I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna set a constant num rows. Let's say we'll create something that has 10 rows. And we want to iterate that by the integer of one at a time. So let's just say we want to draw um, 10 rows of rectangles. So I can start to call rect. So I want to say all of these rectangles to be near the middle of the screen. So I'm going to set the X position. And now I want them to be a proportion of the actual height. So I'm going to do height times I over num rows. And then I just need to set the width of those boxes. All right. What am I doing wrong here? Okay, so let's see. Four. All right, well, we can try it out at least. Let's see if I set, I'm not getting any rectangles here. Do I have my syntax incorrect? So for i less than or equal to number of rows, i plus plus rect width. All right, so there's my rectangle when it's drawn outside of the for loop. width and my height is zero, my rectangle is 10. Ah, yes, I do, I my syntax is incorrect here. So I defined, I started off, I said let i, but I need to set that equal to something to begin with. There we go, there's a, there's a box for us. So I'm going to go back to my height times i of number of rows. There we go. Now we have 10 rectangles that go across the height of our screen. All right. So let's maybe start to um, manipulate some of these individually. So let's say we want these to move 
across our screen. So we can start to let's bring in our um, value, our um, value that oscillates between zero and one. And so now instead of just one box, we have 10 boxes dancing across the screen. And we can now just easily say, I want to draw instead of 10 boxes, let's draw 100. So now I have 100 boxes bouncing across the screen here. And let's just make this a little more um, modular. So right now we do have that, the width and height hard coded in as, a, as 10. So let's just say, I'm gonna set a width parameter to, let's just say, make it five pixels. All right. Okay, and so let's speed that up just a little bit. <laughs> Oh, I, I made a big boo-boo here. So I created this constant width, but do you remember the width is a predefined value in P5JS, so I don't want to overwrite that. So let's just change this to rect width. Oh, well, and you always get some fun whenever you uh, mess things up. Typically you get a fun little, um, crazy thing going. Now we have cubes that are bouncing super, super fast because my step value is pretty high. So I can kind of, I can change the speed of things just by altering the size of that step value right here. Actually, I'm just going to comment out this so we don't have Oh yeah, a lot of the cool stuff, the fun stuff I've made in here is typically because of some happy accident that occurs when you're trying to do something specific. So now let's see, let's start to maybe play around with moving things uh, across, maybe up and down as well. So right now, I'm just gonna start to break things up into multiple lines here. So it's easier for me to keep track of what I'm messing with. So here I'm just breaking up my rectangle definition or parameters. So I have one line for my X, one line for my Y position and one line for my uh, width and height. All right, so we always want these to be based around this position right here. So I'm just gonna surround that in parentheses so I know my order of operations here. And let's just say, let's add something to that say we let's make them bounce around um, the actual height of the rectangles themselves so plus rect width times sine step so what is that going to give us plus rect width times sine step so that's going to be so it's kind of hard to see here. Let's make that, but they are vertically moving from a zero position of their original position plus the rectangle width. Let's just make this uh, a bigger number. Let's just say 500 so we can actually see the changes that are happening here. All right, so now we've got these moving vertically. Let's just say rect width times two times sine step. And let's just make our rectangles bigger. All right. So now we can start trying to um, start moving some things in two different, along two different axes. And let's see, maybe we can start moving things independently of one another. So, okay, so we have our width times sine step 
So that's always going to be um, a unique value. Maybe we can increase the speed of these by a little bit. Let's see what happens when we multiply this by i. How about we make that a fraction of width over i times num rows. Oh. There we go. Now we start to get something. Okay, so what is it giving us here? So now we're alternating in between. So our width, so we're taking a fraction of our width for each. Oh, I've got this backwards here. I width times I over number of rows. So now things are going to be moving horizontally and vertically. And let's multiply this by side step. Let's see what we get here. All right. So now in this case, um, we're moving, uh, we're not moving the first rectangle that we've drawn horizontally at all. And it is now we're taking the fraction of the width and multiplying that by that ever changing step between zero and one. All right, let's add one more level in here. So instead of just moving things based on, um, say, the rectangle width, let's create a nested for loop here. And here, I'm going to create another constant is just going to be, we're going to create columns now. And let's say, let me just make that a hard value as well. Okay. Oh, that's my J value. Uh-oh. That's not good. Flew too close to the sun. So one thing you will find, um, the one thing I should have been doing too, is that the P5JS browser does crash if you um, try to do something a little too crazy, which is okay. We can, and the other big mistake I've been making too is not saving. So we're gonna have to lose everything we just made, which is not a problem. Because you can see, oh nice, I did save it. Take it back. Auto save for the win there. Okay, so now let's actually make this not so crazy. Let j equal zero, j less than or equal to num columns, and so j plus plus. So I need to define my just find it up here under number of rows 10 all right and I'm going to put in my brackets okay so let's see what we're dealing with here let's just go ahead and play so right now um, we have this extra for loop in here so now we're looping from I through number of rows, that's going to be 10 times. And then we're looping through um, J zero through number of columns, that's going to be 10 times. So this is going to end up drawing 10 times 10 things. So let's add this, uh, let's just add this J variable in here and see what happens. So instead of I, oh, so now I have rows and columns of things all moving around. So one thing I like, let's set 
I like stationary things. Let's say width times i over num columns. So now we have nice pulsating up and down. And let's make this height times j over num rows. And just to be consistent with my naming here, num calls, num rows. All right, so now we have rectangles. We can create a nice, cool grid. I've been really into these like square grids recently, as I've been messing around with P5 a little bit to prep for this workshop today. So now we can start to do some cool things. So let's, so let's say, um, let's make all this relative to the width of our screen and the width of our rectangle. All right, so I have my rectangle width set to 20. And let's say I want the number of rows to be relative to the width of my rectangle. So let's say, um, or this, I guess this would be the height. So I'll say height divided by rect width. Okay. And then we'll just have to work on some positioning of stuff here and say, I want the same to be for my number of columns. So width divided by rect width. All right, so now we just have a nice grid. That's always just gonna be based on the width and height of the display size that we have. Okay. So I'm gonna actually, we'll make, we wanna draw less of these. So I'm gonna make our rectangle widths a little higher. So, if, so what I'm doing here, I have my rectangle width that's gonna be set to a hard number. And then it's going the number of rectangles we're gonna draw is gonna be a fraction of how many times that width goes into the width, height and width of the, uh, of the screen. So if I pass in bigger numbers, it's gonna be larger squares. And if I pass in smaller numbers, it's gonna be a lot of small squares. So let's say if I start to draw a whole bunch of things on the screen at one time, it's gonna to start to get pretty laggy and janky. All right. So now maybe let's try to do something here. All right, so I am putting my squares uh, in a grid. And again, all based on um, the width and height. So what's some fun things we can actually do with this now? Um, one thing we could do is start to play around with some noise. So a cool thing that P5 has built into it is allows you to kind of uh, jitter things around or start to add some randomness to create cool little patterns. So. So one thing we have is we have this random function. So let's just try that. All right, well, so let's just say rect width times random. So that's just gonna generate a random number and a row. So we start to get some really crazy things going on here. So let's say, we'll make that a little less So now, let's see, we can see it bouncing around there at the bottom a little bit because things are getting written over. So let's say minus rect width. I'll make it even smaller. So a lot of things are just playing around with uh, editing, like changing how much of something you want to, uh, like when I'm, when I'm adding in this randomness here, like, I don't want it to be too big. Um, so we were, random is gonna generate a number between zero and one randomly. And I was multiplying that by rect width. So that means the, the size of my rectangle is gonna be anywhere between zero and at, at this point, 40. 
So I don't want it to vary that much because it does. It's kind of a little more um, uh, in your face. Like it's a little too much when it's just, well, so this is too little here. But well, this does create kind of a cool uh, randomness to it. Let's just say two times that random number between zero and one. Actually, this is kind of cool. It does create kind of an effect of like, is it moving or is it not moving? It's just barely jittering a little bit. You can also play around. Um, so instead of random, which generates just, uh, again, a random number between zero and one, you can try to make that randomness a little smoother. We can call this random Gaussian, which creates uh, um, produces a random number that's based on uh, a Gaussian distribution, meaning it's going to be closer to, um, at least in this case, a central value of zero. So it's going to be a smaller, what's more likely to be a smaller um, random change, which is going to be, it just looks a little more natural. And let's just lower the number of rectangles that we're drawing here. And there's one other randomness we can play with here. There is actually a noise value or um, let's see, I think, there we go, okay. So noise, it generates um, Perlin noise, which I can't describe what that does, but I know just from messing around, the parameter it needs is a value that's um, changing. So I'm gonna pass in my step value here. And this is gonna create a more kind of, uh, again, like a, a pulsating um, change over time. I just need to, right now that value might be very small. Let's multiply it by 10 and see, this kind of creates more of like a, a more natural change in, uh, in the, in the um, parameter that we're manipulating over time. Let's add in, so right now you notice all those boxes are kind of, it's almost like they're breathing in and out, but they're all doing it at the same time. That's because we need to actually edit that value on a per um, on a per um, loop basis. So right now, I'm multiplying or I'm using that noise value, and I'm adding i to it. So you remember i is running ten times, and so now it's going to create kind of a um, a flowing pattern. So i is my uh, is my x position. So it's going to create kind of a moving from left to right pattern. Like let's say if I change this to J. So now I'm editing things along my vertical axis here. Let's just make this even bigger so maybe it'll be a little more obvious. So now we have some like rows of dancing things. Let's make it change along the vertical and horizontal. So now we have a diagonal along which we're manipulating these rectangles. And now let's start to mess around with that. Let's go back to our just black background. Oh, that's kind of cool like black stars or white stars in the black sky, black night sky. Let's say we want to create some kind of trail, trailing effects. I need to make it a little larger here or maybe smaller. What do I want to do? All right, so this is kind of cool. Let's do, let's do one other thing. Let's say instead of uh, the boxes getting smaller, they overwrite each other. So here's one thing we haven't done yet. We haven't actually, we can set the colors of, um, of the rectangles and we haven't done anything with color yet. I'm gonna call this function called fill. So any shape you draw has two basic um, P 
pieces that you can change the color of. You can change the fill, which is the inside, or you can change the stroke, which is the outside. So I'm just going to say, let's make some gray boxes. And one thing I can do too is just similar to background, I can either pass in one or four parameters here. So let's say we'll create black boxes. Well, we need one color because our background is black. So okay, we'll go with blue boxes. And then we can set the opacity of those. So now we can get some even funkier stuff starting to go on here. Uh, so I made these almost completely opaque. Let's set. There we go. So now we start to get some of these like gridded patterns that are really cool looking. Let's say I love to go with the fuchsia color here. All right. So we have our grid of rectangles. Let's just say we're not confined to just using rectangles. Let me just quickly see if we can call an ellipse in here and start to see some other things. Let's, let's just work on our ellipses for a little bit here. All right, so now we get some like cool circular patterns going on. But one thing I don't like is how we can easily see the um, the outline of all these circles. So one thing we can do, let's just get rid of, that's called the stroke. We can call this function no stroke. And now we get some, I don't know, some cool like flower. I'm gonna start to edit some of these parameters we're messing with here. So now things are kind of pulsating along. So that's the J, J is our vertical axis. And let's make those smaller. So these might actually look a little bit more like stars. Oh yeah, I think I like the circles. Let's bump it up some. Let's say we want to draw a whole bunch of circles here. Oh. And let's switch it back to doing things along the diagonal. And maybe that's too much noise there. You can make it much more subtle by adding, so kind of that, I'm multiplying the noise by a scalar here. And so, you know, the bigger I make it, the bigger it'll be. See what happens to so let's start to create different color ellipses. All right, so I've got that ellipse. Let's draw something else in here. So I'm going to draw another set of ellipses. So right now they're just being drawn on top of each other. But let's see, I am now just going to change the the axes along which they're changing. So right now, the I value, which is going to be along my horizontal axis. So now I get this kind of like two, two level effect here. I'll take out the opacity of those. Uh, let's add it back. So now I'm starting to get some cool patterns. Let's just add in another one here. Let's make this one go along the vertical axis. And we can make this one bigger. Maybe a little smaller. But at any rate, you can start to see some of the fun cool things that start to happen here. And maybe instead of uh, messing around with the 
rectangle width. Let's say we want this all to vary around. So now that rectangle size isn't going to change at all. So that's just a set value. So we actually want to do it around opacity. So let's see, what can we do with this here now? So now that noise value, let's just actually We'll call our, well, that's going to be drawn too many things. Well, at any rate, <laughs> you can start to mess around. You see how we can start to draw things and then really start to just play around with the different variables we have access to and altering those little parts that define all of these different shapes, like the position, the size, the color. Um, like, let's say, let's just do some different color stuff here and you can start to see maybe how the different circles kind of layer themselves on top of each other. So we still get these patterns, but it's kind of, uh, um, it's random, but it's not random. All right. And if I can figure out how to change that opacity value, so what would be a good way to, so 255 times that. So that might be changing a little bit. I don't know, but at any rate, this looks cool to me. All right. Well, this is a, um, again, just demoing some of the cool stuff you can do with, uh, with P5 and really just kind of scratching the surface. There's so many cool things that people have done. Like, let's see, let's, let's stop this. I'm going to save it real quick. Like, let's see. The cool thing with uh, the P5 editor too is when you create stuff, you can start to, uh, you can save it and then you can call it up at a different time. So here's something I was working on previously using the same kind of idea of um, uh, creating these grid patterns and then altering the look of them over time. So here I'm using squares and then uh, changing the opacity of them over time. And let's see, where was a, another cool one? Let's see. Oh yeah. So here's the, here's something using uh, how you can draw lines using uh, vertices and then using that um, per limb noise. So here is creating kind of like that wavy pattern. And right now, since I'm streaming this, it's moving. It's very, very janky and moving kind of, uh, uh, you know, like a step at a time. But if you're running this on your own machine or in your browser, it would be like a smooth transition from side to side. So with that, uh, unless there are any questions, I think that might be all I got, unless people just want to see some other crazy patterns on the screen. But I'm, I'm happy to stick around and ask any or answer any questions. Again, I am by no means uh, 
an expert in P5 or um, really creative coding. It's just something I find fun and interesting to mess around with. And I can just sit down for, you know, like an hour or something, draw some things and then mess around with those parameters to create cool, funky patterns like what you see on the screen here. All right. Well, cool. Well, thanks again, y'all. And if there's not anything else, I am going to sign off. I'll just give it a second. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. I would love to do it again. There's always new and cool things you can generate. All right, that's it. Okay, I'm signing off. I will see you all later.